Um, hello, everyone who is joining. Thank you so much for, for being here. My name is Sitlali Ochoa. I am a staff attorney at the International Justice Resource Center in San Francisco, and I'll be moderating today's event, which will hopefully and likely be a lively discussion on efforts to advance the human right to housing in California, and through, including through engagement with international human rights oversight bodies and to highlight developments that have happened in the last few years. Joining me today is Leah Simon Weisberg, who is the legal director at the Alliance of Californians for Community Empowerment, also known as ACE in Oakland. She has been representing tenants for over two decades. This past winter, she represented Moms for Housing and used the human right to housing to defend several homeless Black mothers against eviction. This led to a renewed conversation in the United States about the importance of recognizing that housing is a human right. Um, we also have Leilani Farha, and she is the former UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Housing and Global Director of The Shift. Her work is animated by the principle that housing is a social good, not a commodity. Leilani has helped develop global human rights standards on the right to housing, including through her topical reports on homelessness, the financialization of housing, informal settlements, right-based housing strategies, and the first UN guidelines, guidelines for the implementation of the right to housing. She is the central character in the documentary Push regarding the financialization of housing, and which has also been screened around the world. And finally, we have Paul Bowden, who is the Executive Director of the Western Regional Advocacy Project in San Francisco. Paul served as Executive Director of San Francisco's Coalition on Homelessness for 16 years and was a founder of the Community Housing Partnership, a nationally recognized permanent housing corporation with optional supportive services. He served as president of its board for 10 years, and Paul was also a board member of the National Coalition for the Homeless and co-chair of its Civil Rights and Grassroots Organizing Work Group. Thank you all for being here. And before we get into the questions, I just want to premise this by saying that when we initially planned this panel, the coronavirus was not the global pandemic that it is today the protest and reaction to the police killing of George Floyd and racial discrimination, including the resulting mandated curfews, had not yet taken place. However, both of these events have impacted the right to housing and the experiences of those who are homeless in the Bay Area. So to the extent possible and we're relevant, we'll address the, the effect of these events on the right to housing. So, with that, Leah, I will start with you. Um, the movement to guarantee housing as a human right is growing. Your organization has been actively involved in state advocacy efforts to introduce legislation recognizing the right to housing in California. Can you explain what housing as a human right means and the status of that movement at the moment? Well, I would say that the way we have been talking about it recently, um, I'm not an international law expert as um, uh, Leonie is, so I'll let her um, chime in if I'm not uh, capturing it accurately. But I would say in terms of the, what the movement has meant is really uh, questioning that the only motive and the kind of only allowed justification around the construction of housing and housing policy is whether people are making, not people, corporations are making profit off of housing instead of um, really that it is, it's like food, education, healthcare, it's a basic need and that it's something that um, we shouldn't be balancing, you know, the profit margin, but instead it, it just really taking um, that motive out um, just the way obviously it should for healthcare. Um, and I think that, you know, obviously we have 
been pretending that we have a free market and that that market is somehow um, supposed to be directing our housing policy. And clearly things had gotten just, you know, absolutely, you know, extreme of terrible in, in California and, um, you know, enough is enough. And so I think that, you know, and I can get in, you know, later about kind of how Moms for Housing came about as one of the important steps and, you know, kind of standing up and saying, we're just not doing this anymore. And we're, we're really going to change what it looked like, looks like. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll go into kind of why we use that as the defense when we, um, later on when we get to get there. Great. Thank you. Um, Leilani, I'll move to you in your role as the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Right to Housing, you visited the Bay Area in 2018. During your visit, you noted that there's a cruelty here that you don't think you've seen before. Can you provide an overview of the, over, the international human rights framework with respect to the right to housing and describe how your findings following the visit to the Bay fit within that framework? Sure, thank you very much. First of all, I just wanna say thanks for inviting me to participate in this. I, I feel like I'm sitting with two real change makers and uh, I really enjoy your company. So just a th thanks for letting me be part of this. Um, yeah, so I what what Leah said actually is exactly <laughs> consistent with what we understand the right to housing to mean at the international level. I'll just comment on my comment in 2018 when I was um, graciously invited uh, into some homeless communities, encampments, um, where I was generously uh, provided with time by people living on the streets who have more important things to do than speak to an international human rights lawyer in some ways, like survival. And um, from my various um, own observations, as well as from what I learned from experts like Paul, um, I had to say I did find what was happening and what is still happening in the Bay Area um, to be cruel. And that's, it's just a simple human observation the way um, the state and state officials, I don't mean California, I mean anyone acting at using government authority, um, were inter, inter, and the police interacting with people who are the most vulnerable and who have nothing. I, I just, there's no other way to understand that as just cruel and um, lacking in recognition of us being one big human family. And that gets us to the definition of the right to housing under international human rights law and an understanding of what are human rights. Like where did human rights come from? They came from the atrocities of World War II when it became apparent that human beings can treat other human beings like uh, I don't know, objects and with cruelty. And we can wrest from people their dignity. That that one human can do that to another human. And that the power, that the state can use its power, governments can use their power to strip a person of their dignity. That's why we have human rights encoded in international human rights law from those atrocities of World War II. And what I witnessed in the Bay Area was simply that, a replication of that, the resting of human dignity. And that's what I see um, as being fundamental to why housing is a human right. And I think my co-panelists understand this well, as do people living this experience. I mean, living in homelessness, it's very difficult. You, every homeless person is clinging to their dignity. That's what they're clinging to. And dignity is the core of, of human rights. The right to housing is defined as the right to a, a, a place to live in peace, security, and with dignity. That's actually the definition. It includes four walls and a roof, but it includes so much more than that. 
it includes housing that's affordable, that's adequate, that's close to transportation, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. And so if you look at what's happening with respect to housing and homelessness around the world, but also in the Bay Area, everything that's happening triggers a human rights concern, in my opinion. You know, if you're letting single moms live in homelessness when there are vacant <coughs> properties, you're tr that, that creates a dignity concern, that creates a right to life concern, and that triggers human rights. And when human rights are triggered, we should have a human rights response. I'll just leave it there. I thank you for that um, great overview. Uh, Paul, going <coughs> over to you, your organization has been responding to systemic causes of poverty and homelessness for a long time now. Based on your work, what do you think are the main factors that have contributed to the housing, housing crisis in the Bay? Uh, I think Pat, not, go even ahead. Just the, not even just the Bay, but I think it's, it's racism, classism, and neoliberalism. I mean, that's, that's homelessness in a nutshell. If, you know, we need to remember that we live in a colonized country. So it's been inherent when we talk about systemic racism, it's been ingrained and inherent in the founding documents of this country. This country was, you know, found, it wasn't lost. There were people living here. You know, this country was colonized. And I think the sooner we get realistic about that and start addressing that, we can't change it. We can't go back in, in time and change it, but we sure as hell can get honest about it and we can start addressing it systemically. And when you, when you, understand that when Reagan came in and, and did the massive cuts to affordable housing, it only took two years from 80 to 82. San Francisco opened its homeless programs in October of 82. And I know that because I was there. So us old guys got to remember that history and teach that history and then get out of the way and let the, the young people actually make the changes that need to happen. But it was a direct result to massive cuts to affordable housing programs at the same time that the federal government tripled the homeowner mortgage interest deduction programs. Cause and effect. One is economic stimulus because the money goes to mortgage companies and to real estate developers and to, to markets. And so that subsidized $140 billion a year through the IRS and everybody that's eligible for it gets it. It's a right. But the housing subsidies for poor people at $37 billion a year, over $100 billion less, is charity. And you have to be eligible. And where were you born? And do you have a felony? Like this is housing subsidy is a housing subsidy is a housing subsidy. It's not that we're not subsidizing housing, it's that we're deciding that the housing that benefits corporate America, i.e. neoliberalism, is the housing that is worthy of continued housing subsidies. The housing that benefits poor people is not. It's charity and we don't know if we can afford it and we have like totally incompetent people running it. Homelessness gets out of, out of hand they changed the way they count the number of homeless people. I mean, COVID clearly showed everybody, if they were looking, clearly showed that our homeless programs in the United States are predicated upon the kind of abuse and oppression that Lalani got to a taste of in Skid Row and in the Bay Area and other places, I'm assuming. But those people didn't become homeless suddenly. Those people were homeless already. They became 10 times more visible because the cops stopped messing with them. That's what makes our homeless program. If, if people can't see it, if the media can't see it, homelessness is non-existent. If we see it, we have a problem. So the solution is to make it disappear. And the way that you make it disappear is you put people in jails because nobody goes there anyway except those that deserve it, which is an asinine concept. 
and you use police and you use private security and you promote business improvement districts in order to push it out of sight, make it hide, make it invisible, and then you've solved the problem because the problem isn't inhumane housing for poor people. The problem is the, the inconvenience of having to see the, the effect of inhumane housing for poor people. Thanks. Um, some, as you explained, some, that effect has been seen in the Bay Area. Leah, you have been working with individuals who are experiencing home, homelessness, even when there are four times as many empty homes, for example, in Oakland, as there are people living without homes. Um, this has prompted movements such as the Moms for Housing movement. Can you describe a bit more how Moms for Housing came about, their work, and how your organization supports that movement? Right, so, um, you know, essentially Moms for Housing was an, um, you know, it, it was an action, right? It was civil disobedience because no one was paying attention, no one was listening. And we do have just you know, an incredible number of people who, who are working, um, several jobs. And yet, um, like one of the families were on their second year living in a congregant um, shelter. So children, I mean, and one of her kids really had no memory of not living in that shelter. And, um, you know, Carol Fife, who, um, you know, is the director of, um, of ACES Oakland office, really was at the center of this. And she had, I mean, I'll just kind of basically um, share with you what she shares when asked this question. Um, you know, there were four or five uh, women who had been part of her life, who had done, you know, activism with her, mostly around schools in a... Um, kind of a mother's project that she'd been working on for years. She'd known these women for years. And one after the other, and over you know, a six week period, several of them had come to her and said, I'm homeless and I just don't know what to do. I've been working full time and I can't, I just can't find any housing I can afford. I can't find anyone to rent to me. And Carol, who was just really, you know, well-respected in the community, well-connected, couldn't, you know, couldn't make it happen for them either. And it was just like week after week, what do we, I, I just can't make this happen. I can't help people get housing. I can't, you know, be willing to help them with their security deposit. It was just like none, all the programs are failing, right? Here were mothers who were great moms, who were working hard and the whole system was failing. And, you know, I think the thing that was just like the, the last straw was that an elder, um, who had become homeless, um, and all of these women were, were black, came to her and basically was going to try and commit suicide because she'd found out that it was a way to get some kind of shelter. And, you know, I think it just was, it just, there was this, this shift, <laughs> um, you know, and this moment where it was like, okay, enough. And, um, and, and also this simultaneous uh, awareness of, just hundreds and hundreds of units across the city empty, um, being reserved for a few days a month for short-term rentals, and corporations coming in, buying them, kicking people out, leaving them empty to be used basically as hotels, and just everything completely out of whack. And you know, every year we have a campaign called Close the Loopholes because capitalism is just really good at finding ways around regulation. And it was just kind of this, how can we keep up with trying to find every game that's being used to turn um, the housing into a commodity, and commodity instead of providing housing. And um, the there's a particular, you know, there's lots of bad corporations doing lots of bad things. One of them is Wedgwood. And they actually one of the worst actors around foreclosure. And, and I think, you know, to just really lift up what Paul was talking about, knowing the history and that all of this is within the context of history. Um, and that, you know, in, in many ways, I, I watched Lani's, your, your film um, just, just after all of this. I think it was just at the kind of the, the cusp of it. And I kind of, you know, it was this realization of, oh, yeah. I mean, everything that you walked through in that film was just, I felt like this was just another example of exactly what you were talking about. And, um, 
you know, which is great in that it really helped me think through a lot of, of the work, giving, kind of gave me some of those structures, but also just like we know that the answers are there. This is not about that. This is really about creating that balance um, between, you know, enormous wealth and this value that at least in American society is placed on making profit and, you know, human rights, one of being, one of which is, is housing and trying to make that at least balanced because right now it's completely um, disconnected. And so um, this property was, was identified, one of the many that are empty in a historically black community. And, you know, there was lots of structure behind it and a, and a movement that has been building um, a collaboration between, you know, lefty um, anti-supremacist white folks. And, um, you know, we have a amazing dynamic leadership of black leaders. And it was a really great example of what happens when people come together um, with that amount of insight and already training. Um, and so there was, it wasn't just random, here's a, you know, boarded up house. It was very conscious that it was owned by a corporation, that it was sitting empty there for a while. And there was a lot of door knocking and talking to the neighbors to say how do they feel about the fact that that property was empty? How do they feel about the crisis? And that was really key. I mean, the, the level of organizing was phenomenal and in taking very seriously. And that's why I think it's important um, that all of these things are about organizing and that you have to do the work. That the change happens when people are doing the work. Um, and actually, you know, as lawyers, we are a little bit, um, you know, if we are a licensed body and we have to maintain, to maintain our license, there are certain rules we can't cover. So to be frank, I entered this movement. I mean, I was working with ACE and as a tenant attorney and all of these things, but there's kind of a, um, uh, if I become aware that my clients are going to um, participate in something that may not be considered legal, um, I can't, I, uh, my only role is to show them how they can follow the law. And so frankly, I knew that, found out this was happening after it happened and, um, you know, was there in the audience just like everybody else, um, you know, when it was announced. And then my job essentially was to keep um, the moms there as long as possible for us to hopefully convince the corporate owners to sell the property back to the community. I mean, I think we had hoped that they would just give it to donate it. Um, so how did it, you know, I mean, I think that we had already, I mean, and I think, um, you know, there had already been a movement to talk about the, the right to housing and that's been alive, you know, for quite a long time. But I think that basically, um, you know, when I had to go and defend to keep them in the house, um, you know, I, there was <laughs> these particular party, late, we'd actually passed a law because they were manipulating the system. And we created an opportunity that if you were, the property was post foreclosure, you could actually go in and say, um, you didn't name me. I'm not on, I, you didn't name me in the lawsuit and I'm putting myself in for the eviction. And we had changed it for this particular corporation because they kept doing that during the foreclosure crisis. So it was odd that I was then using a law that I'd helped pass, not really the way it was intended, but essentially I put them in. But I couldn't say that they had been, um, to use it, I have to show that they have a right to occupy it. A right to possession is actually what the, the law says, a right to possession, which really just fit perfectly into this because we were saying they had a right to possession because they are homeless because it's empty. And um, our community is saying we need these properties back in the community. And so it, it just kind of one night, we were kind of like, okay, what are we going to do? Then I was kind of like, well, they have a right to possession. And I had to come up with what? And I had actually been involved in creating this form that I was filling out. And I had put in other, you know, four years before when we were getting this through. So what is the other? Because they weren't tenants. They weren't the prior owner. Um, they weren't sub tenants. And I said, so I put in, uh, you know, the human right to housing and, um, that's how it started. And then, um, I mean, Lenny, you, you, you created the, the a premise for, I mean, in, in terms of like, we all had the, some of the language because of your film, because the work you had already done. Um, and then Eric Tars, um, I read his, he had a, you know, really important person in this country in terms of like having done this. I think he's been really 
trying to push this for, I mean, I think as long as 15 years, but he, anyway, he has a great, it's called Great Scots. Um, it's a law review for us, you know, nerdy lawyers. And I was just able to use it and use it in our, um, you know, in the argument that I made, we were actually able to make an argument. I mean, I have to say, like for me, from a legal perspective, you know, housing is very limited in terms of how we are able to, um, you know, fight these issues. Um, but we did use, um, you know, I, I used a Supreme Court case called Green versus Superior Court, um, where the court had done a similar thing in the 70s, where they just totally changed the law because it was necessary. And so my argument was, we are now at that point again, where the courts have to just change the law because essentially they're out of date. Because there is so much homelessness, um, the courts had, you know, that there were the facts necessary and they could do, take that action and recognize a right to, to housing. And I think that if we might have gone further um, and tried to do that legal claim going forward, but ironically, the, the politicians got involved and the mayor convinced the landlord to sell the property. So it all kind of, um, you know, the idea of continuing litigation and litigation rarely gets us where we need. It's usually the, it's more about giving us the time for the organizers to do the work, which is what it ended up doing. Um, but I think it, it began an important conversation and continues. So great. I'll stop there. Thank you. Eric's a nerdy uh, lawyer, but he's our nerdy lawyer. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, shifting gears a little bit to the COVID nineteen pandemic, we know that it has created created a host of new challenges for homeless communities, and it's likely to impact future housing policies. Leilani, can you discuss some of the government responses to COVID? 19 and how these impact the experiences of those living in homelessness, as well as other housing issues, and where possible, maybe identify some of the best practices? Sure. Um, well, I'm going to start with um, the total failure. <laughs> Because COVID-19, the world over, should have ended homelessness. Because the World Health Organization and every single government around the world adopted a single policy as the prescription against COVID-19. And that single policy was stay home, wash your hands, and physical distance. And there, the only possible and logical conclusion and understanding of stay home, wash your hands and physical distance from the perspective of homelessness is an end to homelessness. I, it, it's just so like, that's the law. I mean, okay, I am a lawyer, but that's the logical extension. Stay home. You don't have a home. You need a home. Here's a home. So obviously it would never be that easy. And I'm not suggesting you just shove homeless people into homes that by any stretch, I'm not suggesting that. But there has been very little movement, very little movement on the ground, though I know California has seen some improvements in different cities. But there has been very little movement. I haven't seen any politician stand up at any level. Now, I'm not privy to everything, but and say, bam, this pandemic tells me something. We have to end homelessness. That should have been. I, in actual fact, the World Health Organization themselves should have said that. And then every government who adopted the stay home policy should have said that. And so, so I have a damning critique, I have to say. And, and um, so I'm seeing little good policy here, little good policy there. Some of these empty hotel rooms, some of these not empty homes, but some of the empty hotel rooms are being used to house homeless people. I know San Francisco made that move. I know LA was doing that. Uh, Vancouver uh, has done the same. Toronto is doing the same. It's not enough. There isn't a long-term plan in place in most of these cities to ensure access to adequate housing and uh, with social supports as necessary, uh, you know, into the future. So, so 
I'm, I, I know you wanted me to talk about good practices, but they're, they aren't good enough for me to put them on the table, in my opinion. I, I refuse to celebrate, first of all, what are the obligations of governments. I'm not going to sell it. Like, people want me to celebrate that the city of Toronto has acquired motel and hotel rooms. I'm not celebrating that. I'm saying, good, you've done, you, you're starting to meet your obligation. That's all I'm willing to, that's what I'm willing to cede. Sorry. And, and many of us have been battling with government officials at every level for 20 years longer to adequately address homelessness in keeping with human rights standards. And so, so, um, the other thing that I have found, um, you know, distressing is there are inadequate protect protections for those who actually still are renting and able to rent and able to pay their rent or not able to pay their rent. So with COVID, of course, came huge in the States in particular, huge unemployment and underemployment. And what we see, and that's the same in Canada and Western Europe, and we know economies are contracting. So those, those are not jobs that are going to be um, uh, necessarily replaced one for one or, or uh, re-energized one for one. Uh, and what we saw after one month of lockdown, one month, renters not being able to pay their rent, which suggests what? It suggests housing unaffordability. It suggests the cost of ha the, it suggests the rent is too damn high. And it suggests that incomes are too low generally. And so people didn't have savings, right? And without savings, bam, one month housing precarity. So that's, to me, as an advocate, it's very distressing. And then we're looking forward. And I don't swear as much as Paul, but I'm going to, but now I'm going to, I'm going to join his ranks. I mean, it's a shit show if you look forward, sorry, but it is because though there have been moratoriums on evictions in some place, well, most places have moratoriums. They're not always abided by, but where, though there are moratoriums, there's in many places, they're actually until the end of the pandemic. And so landlords are wringing their hands. When do I get to evict these people who are falling into arrears? That's one. Two, we, we, which is very disturbing. And, you know, Spain is the example of how not to do things. After the global financial crisis, so many people have been evicted and they have a growing homelessness problem there. So, I mean, that's not the road we want to go down. At the end of a pandemic, Everyone should come out whole. All of us who managed to survive the pandemic should come out whole. And by whole, I mean adequately housed with our dignity intact. And so those renters I'm very concerned for who, who may now become homeless. And then I'll just say one more thing. What's going to happen, and, and, and it, it was on the front page of my national newspaper, what is absolutely going to happen is there will be a lot of distressed assets on the market through this pandemic. And we might not see them in month one after the pandemic, but we will start seeing them six months thereafter. Just like with the global financial crisis, it took about a year before we really started to see all the distressed assets on the market. And, and that is the and we have really low interest rates everywhere. Those are the perfect conditions for those big financial actors, Wedgwood, others, to come in and buy up those distressed assets, sit on them, and then rent them back to, to people who desperately need them. And then we're back into this whole financialization nightmare and unaffordability. So no good news from me, sorry. <laughs> um, I just wanted to highlight one thing you said said, I think it's important to recognize that most states are not meeting their obligations, and some are just barely meeting those obligations. And I think that's important for all of us to remember. Um, Paul, can you elaborate on how some of the government responses or lack of responses are impacting the communities that you work with and any steps that you or your organization have taken in response? 
Yeah, and definitely don't be don't be asking me for who's doing it right because when it comes to poverty and race issues in the United States, ain't none of them doing it right. And when we talk about oh, this place is giving people hotel rooms, they're going through centralized intake. They're using the homeless system that created the situation that all of these people were homeless when the after 37 years of homeless programs. I mean, how much more of an example of absolute total failure would you need to document when they do shelter in place or stay home and millions of people across the country still 37 years after the Reagan cuts at HUD and USDA have no home to go to. And yet they are using that system to put people into these hotel rooms or to set up sanctioned encampments with coordinated intakes and priorities set by some asshole in, in the bureaucracy at HUD. And then that plays out at the local level where they say, oh, Breed, you're putting people in hotel rooms. No, they ain't. They're playing a shell game. They're trying to make it look like they're putting people into hotel rooms and only certain people and only if they agree to asinine rules in Alameda where Leah is, you, ha you could only go outside for 20 minutes at a time, three times a day, and you couldn't lock your hotel room door. How does that even remotely relate to housing? That is not housing, that's, that's a program, that's a, that's a miniature jail. It's a, it's a liberal's version of what a jail is. And this, this approach of you know, point in time head counts, another example, the numbers of homeless people get too high. So on January 25th, of all the days, only a bureaucrat could come up with January 25th being the day that you go out and do a point in time head count, meaning you, point, you count the numbers of heads of people that are sleeping in your street on January 25th, and that becomes your homeless number. And every media outlet uses it. Every media outlet played into, and I'm talking even like Stephen Colbert and shit like that. Like every media outlet played into Utah had ended homelessness. Utah's doing more sweeps today than they've ever done. But they made homelessness disappear. And that's the, the, the big challenge that we're having. And thanks to the People's Parity Project and, and the Catalyst Program, we have an army of, of law students that are out working with, we've put together an organizing campaign based on organizations that are absolutely directly connected to the people that are living outside in encampments and under threat of being swept. And now we have these students working with the local community members. And Lalani will tell you, when I'm talking about in the encampments, I mean in the encampments and that are working with prioritizing the legal research so that when we go to the attorneys, we know what our rights are, we know what the abuses are, we know who's doing it, and we have a legal strategy to fight it. So we're not going to the lawyers cap in hand and saying, oh, they're beating us up, help us. We're going there saying, we did the freaking research. We know what the law is. And, and usually I think it, to make systemic change, you're gonna have to talk about legislative approaches not just legal approaches because when the judges look at us and the city comes in with these you know two hundred thousand dollar a year people that can know can bs better than most and say oh but look judge this is the system and this you know boise doesn't apply to us because we have this congregant shelter where this this person that's severely mentally ill can go that's not residential treatment that's not treatment at all that's a setup for failure. And who gets blamed when the system don't work? The homeless people. Who gets blamed when, when neoliberalism dictates that housing is, is no longer anybody's right? Not regardless of a human right, nobody's entitled to it unless they're rich enough to freaking buy it. So the corporations buy the shit. You know, who gets blamed? Who created homelessness? Homeless people created homelessness. That is asinine. I was homeless for six years and, and I've been doing this for 30. And I never met one person that was in the US Congress that voted on those HUD cuts 
and voted to implement those HUD cuts, that was homeless. Homeless people didn't create this. Homeless people are the ones that are the visible manifestation of a society that is absolutely ignorant of what human rights are. And not even ignorant of it, they just don't care about human rights unless those are my human rights. And, and you look at the, the prioritizing of healthcare, education, housing, and a livable income. What government wouldn't think as government, it's a good idea and it's better for all of us if everybody has, is healthy, well-educated, well-housed, and has a livable income. If you're gonna be in a capitalist system, you might as well make sure everybody gets to play. But those are seen as privileges and only, only eligible to the rich. The rich and the white, yep, healthcare, absolutely. And you, the second largest tax write-off after the mortgage interest program is health benefits that corporations pay. So uh, clearly it's a priority. And when we talk about a tax write-off, if you ask me for 50 bucks and I give you 50 bucks, that's called charity. If you owe me 50 bucks and I tell you to keep it, somehow that's economic stimulus. It's the same thing. It's a subsidy. But healthcare for the corporations, absolutely. Housing for the wealthy, absolutely. You know, but for poor people, no, nah, sorry, we can't afford it. You're not eligible. You didn't get through the intake. Call in every day at this time specifically. And if you miss one day calling in, you're off the waiting list. Go sign up for affordable housing. 15-year waiting list. And when that list gets too long, which it already is, they stop doing intakes. They don't build more housing just like they used to do a gaps analysis to set priorities with homeless money, supply and demand, where's the biggest gap? Now they do point in time headcounts. It's ludicrous only if you think of it in a human context. It's absolutely brilliant if you think of it in a neoliberal context and that's what's keeping us down and that's what's pissing us off and that's why we wanna abolish the police, not just defund them. Because that, that should be a rethinking of how we care for each other and protect each other as a community. And just let go of the colonizing ways that we've been treating each other. I don't know if that answered the question, but I felt good. So. <laughs> um, great. Thank you. Um, we have about 15 minutes left. And I do want to say for people watching from home, there's a little Q&A chat that you can use to submit questions. We'll leave this time for that. So if you have any questions, please go ahead and submit those. And while we wait for people to do that, um, I just want to ask all of you um, in your experience, what have you learned about effective advocacy and what is necessary to move the right to housing forward? Whoever wants to go first. Well, well, you assume we've been successful. The question assumes we've been successful. I think that's why there have been. Why. Yeah. Like, who's been I mean, successful on the panel? Yeah, I, I'll go first if for whatever, because I already took the floor. I mean, um, you know, if I if I believe there, I've had any impact. Um, I'm not a hundred percent certain. Others can weigh in on that, but. Um, um, the first thing is that the people with whom we are advocating decide and define the issues and uh, uh, how things get framed. One of the things I love about working with people living in homelessness or renters in precarious situations or those in informal settlements is they're always very clear on the injustices and human rights violations they are suffering. They don't use my legalese, but they say it, you know, perfectly. I, you know, I, I've had people say to me countless times, especially in California, I just want to be treated like a human being. That's a human rights claim. 
that's like such a strong human rights claim. I've had people uh, say to me, I feel abandoned by my government or governments, right? So that's the first thing. You cannot lead any successful advocacy without listening <laughs> if you're not already part of the population. So in my case, I'm, I'm not part of, I'm well housed and I'm, I've never been homeless, et cetera. So, uh, and then from there, I mean, my, my own experience has been, um, oh, I mean, you know, using every, it's not a one shot thing. I think Leah talked very much about this and Paul does this in his everyday work. It's not about the piece of litigation or the campaign on the streets the you know when you took to the streets that day it's this whole myriad of coming together and collaborative work and you know she's got her legal strengths and they've got their organizing mobilizing strengths and they're good at social media and i think it takes this whole perfect storm kind of thing um to make change and i i guess just to build on that um you know it's it, there's this um you know, that it also, that nothing happens just now, that it, we are building on, you know, and understanding history and knowing that history. Um, and that it's, it, you're building a movement, not a one day activity, which I think is, you know, another way of saying what you said, but also um, that it, you always have to be there in for the long term. And I'm always, I'm, I feel like I always want to go to the next step. Like I'm already thinking about tomorrow. Like when we're, the, when we're out of COVID, what do we need to do? So we're, you know, and, and when we talked about the um, eviction moratoriums, one of the things that we did differently in Oakland, and, you know, that came out of ACE, was that we demanded that you could never evict people for the rent that accrued. And what I wanted to say is it just disappears, but I didn't, we didn't have the power to do that. But I'm hoping that it creates that space, which I think maybe is always my job is to create the space for the next step. But essentially, if you live in Oakland or Berkeley, and now San Francisco just passed it, we're waiting for the second vote. Um, that's true for all tenants in those areas. And so I'm hoping that gives us time to figure out how we get rid of that debt. Um, maybe tenants get to start filing bankruptcy like the president. Um, but we need to get rid of um, that debt. But I have to say that the night I came up with that and I was talking to the legislator and I was talking to the attorneys and they just kept saying, well, we can't do that. And right now there are lots of cities across California who are saying you can't do it. But, you know, I think it is, you know, what we, we talked about earlier in this discussion is, well, what's the alternative? Well, what's your plan? And I think that we have to bring, um, one of my other things is that there are answers. How we get out of this is not complicated or confusing or impossible. Um, that's just nonsense. Um, and I think that we, we have to keep moving forward in that way. Just like there is a clear history on how we got here, um, it is, there are solutions and um, you just need to listen. <laughs> um, but, I, I, but I think that that is, and, I, and then we're only able to do that, I think, is because of the collaboration and that we are able to learn from each other, those of us working on it. But the most valuable thing is that it's an ongoing thing. I will be fighting for tenant rights until I die, not because we've been failing, but because it's an ongoing struggle. And I think for me, you know, the, that realizing that, so I didn't feel like, oh man, they're the, and now the backlash, right? Well, then we just have to push forward knowing that this is an ongoing process and thinking, thinking of what's the next day. I mean, that's, I'm already, I'm already over the COVID. I'm thinking, what, what are we doing the next day? So. <laughs> And, and I think, you know, one of the key things for the, the member organizations that created RAP is who, who are you representing? When you say, we think this, mm -hmm. I want to know who the hell is we? Because poor people and homeless people got so many self-identified leaders that go in looking for victories as opposed to going into this looking to change the system. And, and to legitimately respond to the common threads of what your community is telling you. You know, I, I, I don't know how many UN rapper visits there are, but the, the ones I had been to before Lilani was all of these people repping people, talking to the rapporteurs as opposed to bringing the rapporteurs out into the community 
to meet the people being talked about themselves. And I think part of that is fear. Like, oh shit, what if they don't say what I just said they say? So I, I think we need to have that level of accountability. I mean, why is it that the Democrats aren't supporting Representative Omar's Homes for All bill, which is all about deep project-based and, and maintenance for housing, and instead going with these mealy mouth, you know, emergency shelter grant, housing vouchers. Housing vouchers was a scam from the Clinton administration when they were destroying and making mixed income affordable housing spaces. They call it housing choice voucher to anybody that's actually trying to use those freaking things. Calling it a choice is a misnomer. It's a choice of the landlord. It's not a choice of the per poor person, and that's why you see so many vouchers being turned back in. We certainly saw this with RAD sitting in, Re in Congressman Ellison's office and being told, well, we're never going to get that money, so we need to commodify public housing and sell mortgages in public housing in order to save public housing. How asinine is that? And why is it that our reps are so timid and so shy and so focused on, well, if we can make it look like we won, we got a bill passed, that's all that matters. The lives of the people impacted by that bill is secondary or tertiary to getting the bill passed. And we need to stop accepting that. We need to stop pretending that the, just because you're not a Republican, it means you care about poor people. We need to be demanding that we see concrete addressing the issues. Omar's bill actually responds to the community. It responds to the issue that there is no affordable housing. So you go back, you go to a system of long-term project-based section eights that make housing and ensure housing is, import, is affordable for people in the community. And if you're gonna do mixed income, like they did under Hope Six, you damn well better make the whole community mixed income because they didn't. Only the neighborhoods where poor people lived in the housing projects in the surrounding area through gentrification got displaced in order to do mixed income communities. And I'll never forget Clinton's comment about, well, it's good for poor people to live with people that have more money because it gives them somebody to look up to. Uh-uh, no. That's just condescending BS. And, and then we say, oh, he was, a, he was a good Democrat. Well, no, you know what? We need to get past that and talk about policies and talk about the income and the prioritizing of our funding patterns because this, this whole Republican Democrat game got us to where we are today, which is the most corrupt and, and sick um, president that we've ever had. And I think Trump is a perfect ending to the Reagan revolution. And I just hope it's a permanent ending. We have one question from the audience. In addition to providing housing, cities need to stop criminalizing homelessness. Do you have any suggestions for steps that can be taken in this regard? Maybe Leilani, we are Paul. Well, can I just say Right to Rest Act? Um, we actually ran legislation in Colorado, Oregon, and California to decriminalize sitting, standing, laying down, sleeping, and eating in non-obstructive manner in commercial area and in, in public areas um, based on the historical history of ugly laws in sundown towns and Basarero Treaty and Japanese American exclusion. They all use laws that everybody's going to break. Everybody's going to stand still. Everybody's going to sit down. Everyone's going to lay down. Everyone's going to sleep. And hopefully everyone's going to eat. Only some people end up going to jail and being harassed and being brought into the criminal justice system. And that's whoever the target of the month is that local governments want to make sure they're chasing out of their towns. Sorry, but I couldn't help it. Uh well, I agree with what uh, Paul just said. I mean, there should not be legislation that criminalizes uh, people living in homelessness or poverty, period. Um, I think the whole issue around funding police um, goes directly to that issue because the police are 
criminalizing, as Paul's already spoken to, criminalizing people living in homelessness. But there is a more um, a kind of deeper, more fundamental thing at play here that goes to structural racism, structural inequality, which is how, how do we view people and uh, how do we view racialized people? How do we view African Americans? How do we view Hispanic Americans, et cetera? And I think, uh, and by we, I actually don't mean we, I mean, how do they, the state and government authorities, officials, and many in the broader population, how do they view those populations living in homelessness and poverty? And they view them as subhuman, less than human, less deserving. I mean, there's a whole um, structural inequality thing that happens there. And it is deeply rooted, in my opinion, especially in the United States, in racism. And that's just clear. And I've been recounting all, I've done a fair bit of work in the States, actually, from New Orleans after Katrina to Detroit with the water shutoffs, and then up and down California on the homelessness encampment issue and work. I mean, sometimes it's just been, you know, looking to see and learn. And, and I mean, those things I've just discussed are completely racialized, uh, completely based in structural racism. And so, so there's a, a huge undoing that has a, un, a, a different mindset, different understanding. One of the things I always try, well, I, I say it in speeches and, and I, I would like it for people when they're walking along the street and they see street homelessness. I wish what people could say to themselves is not, oh, there's a drug addict, there's a loser, there's a criminal, there's a illegal whatever. What I want people to see when they see that person living in a tent in the richest country in the, in the world, I want them to say, oh shit, that's the failure of governments to implement their human rights obligations because that's all that is. <laughs> um, can, can I just add one, one other piece that, and actually um, it was from a panel that I think Paul, you were on at another venue that I was in the audience was just, you know, the, the fact that um, when somebody is having a mental health, this health crisis in this country, almost everywhere you call the cops and the cops are the ones who show up. And that's insane. And that's in many ways where it starts. And that, and, and because of the interplay between racism and how we deal with mental illness, um, sometimes people call the police because they're afraid. I mean, we, you know, all of the stuff that um, in terms of when we inappropriately bring police in, um, but just that simple thing, if social workers, um, were the ones we called, if health providers were the ones we called, that would make a huge difference, you know, just, and that, you know, and it'd be even cheaper because social workers don't make as much money as cops. Um, well, I don't want to keep anyone past the time and it's already noon, but thank you so much for joining us, for being here. If you have any final thoughts or comments, please go ahead. Um, but otherwise, I just really want to say thank you from IJRC. We really appreciate you taking time to do this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's been really great conversation. Look forward to seeing you all soon. Likewise, that was yes. great. Thank you, everyone. Thanks all. And thanks everyone who attended. <laughs>